So I want to talk about this 15th chapter of John, and I want to take you back to get into it to some a little bit about what we were talking about last week. And, and last week we were talking about we were talking about powerlessness. And the question that I left you with was the question about where you have God in your house. And we were talking about last week, the, the 14th chapter. And the 14th chapter, Jesus says, here's what I want to do. I want to come and I want to take up residence in you. I want to come to live in you. And I want, him, I want to point out something I didn't talk about last night. And it's important to me to say this. I want you to look up, if you have a Bible you know, look this up sometime. If you don't have a Bible, it'd be a good idea someday to get a Bible. It's a pretty good read, amen? And so in that Bible, in the Gospel of John, I want you to look up the 14th chapter. And when Jesus says, when he says, I'm gonna take up residence in you, look at the bottom of the page. Matter of fact, look at those couple of verses and see if there is an asterisk on those verses where there's gonna be at the bottom of the page a disclaimer. You know how like, you know how like when you go in the um, Verizon store and they go, look at, if you, uh, if you start service with Verizon, you're gonna get like, if you get an iPhone 8, you're gonna get another iPhone 8 for free, right? Except, I kid you not, tell me if I'm wrong. Every freaking time they offer you something for free like that, they call it in the sales side, they call it the, bo the BOGO, buy one, get one. It really is, should be some other an acronym because it's not really, it's really buy one, maybe get one. BOMGO, BOMGO is what it really ought to be, <laughs> right? Because at the, end of the, at the end of the little dealie about the phone, there's a little asterisk, right? And the ask, BOMGO, that's good, man. And then... <laughs> And the thing is, there's a, there really is a point to this. There's an asterisk, right? And it goes, you know, if you're left-handed, if your birthday is on an even day, if you're between the ages of 41 and 41 and a half, if your mom had red hair, if she had only one eye that was working, and if she walked with a slight limp, and your dad played Major League Baseball in left field and won a World Series, then you get the freaking phone for fee, right? I want you to notice in the Bible when Jesus says, I'm coming to live in you, there is no asterisk at the end of those verses and he never talks about how you have to be equipped. Are you worthy? Are you ready? Are you suitable? Are you acceptable? Have you done the right things? Have you had the right thoughts? Do you have your act together? Do you have your show together? Or are you a good enough Christian? Jesus just says, I'm moving in. I need you to hear that. And so my question last week was, you know, where do you have Jesus stashed in your house? Does Jesus get to walk around in your life into any room in your life that he wants? Your past, your present, your future, all the junk everywhere. Does he get to go into your junk room? You know, you can imagine, right? It's embarrassing enough, you know, like, some of you guys are not the world's best, probably, I'm just guessing, uh, housekeepers, right? And so like, if your mom or your dad or your best friend comes into your place, you know, or, or somebody you want to impress, you quickly find that place in your house or in your apartment or whatever where you can put your junk, right? So I want you to imagine the day that Jesus is there at your house. And what are you gonna do when he goes to the room where all your junk is. And he goes, I was wondering like if I could maybe go in there and check out your junk. And you're like, oh no, 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 no. You're only supposed to be in the room of my very best stuff that looks the prettiest. You're supposed to look at the pretty pictures. You're supposed to get the fine china. You're Jesus. You can't, you can't eat off the styrofoam plate and the, you know, the little solo cup. You can't do that. You can't go into my junk room. I would feel like it would be bad. You would discover things about me that I don't want you to know. And you know what Jesus would say? When I came to live in you, I came to live in every single bit of you. The stuff that you don't accept, the stuff that you're afraid of, the stuff that you don't want even you to know about, 
the stuff that you don't want to talk about and the stuff that's killing you. That, that's the room I want to go to. I would like us to go there. Let's go there together. And let's sit down and let's walk through every single piece of what you've been trying to hide. Because you know what? That's how you're going to get well. That's how you're going to get your heart back. That's how your broken heart's going to get really healed. And the longer we want to stash him in one little area of our life, you know, the, the sort of Sunday morning churchy church place, the worse it gets for us. Amen? The worse it gets for us. And so I want to encourage you to continue to think about that question. Where do you have God stashed in your house? The second question tonight is, I want you to think about what you're currently the most attached to. Some of us in this room are the most attached to our fear. Amen? We're the most attached to to our fear. We have decided that our fear is what dominates our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. The way we make decisions is to try to figure out a way to feel less afraid if we can, or we try to accommodate our fear if we can't. Some of us have decided that we are most attached to the stuff in our life that's already happened. We talked about it last week, history. Some of us are most attached to our failure. Some of us are, we think anyway, that we're most attached to a boyfriend or a girlfriend or somebody in our life who we think we just cannot live without. And they have been the person in our life that really they, in a lot of ways, have become our compulsion. And how do you know that? What's the litmus test of someone being your compulsion? It is, it is gonna occur when you realize that they are your only go-to, amen? They are your only go-to. The relationship that you have with them has really become a, an actual idolatry. And it's become an idolatry because they are the only go-to. They are the only count on. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, who do you look to in a relate? Who do you look to in your life to make you happy? Well, most people are gonna say, because they think it's the right thing to say, you know, if they're in a relationship or they're in a marriage, they're gonna go, well, I mean, I actually look to my wife to make me happy. She makes me happy. Or I look to my husband to make me happy. And I'm gonna go, that right there is entirely too much pressure for a marriage or a relationship to withstand, amen? Because some days, I mean, like if you're a guy, we all know this, right? Every 40th day or something, we're gonna get it right by accident and we're gonna do all the stuff we were supposed to do. If you're a guy, say amen, don't be a liar, right? And we're, we're gonna somehow stumble into the perfect day that we can offer up to her, but in my, most days, man, we're just not gonna do it. We're not gonna get it done and then we're gonna feel bad and then we're gonna feel like less, we're gonna feel like a little more afraid to be try to be close to her because man, we've already known we haven't done well and we are, we, you know, we're codependent enough to like worry about that for a while and that'll just make us keep our distance whereas starting off the day going, look, I already know that I cannot be playing the role of God for my wife. I already know right now this morning that I cannot play the role of God for my husband. And if I'm playing that role for my wife, or I'm playing that role for my husband, or I'm playing that role for my girlfriend, or I'm playing that role for my boyfriend, I gotta know that that in and of itself is a compulsion, right? Because that attachment is dangerous for the both of us. What needs to happen is I gotta figure out how to put my relationship into a position where we're, and this is what I wanna talk about tonight, where we're both receiving the healthy attachment to Jesus, and when we're receiving that healthy attachment from Jesus, we're sharing that, what Jesus is giving us, with each other, amen? And now we're getting the good stuff. Because Jesus isn't like us, he's not like hitting the mother load every 40th day, He's hitting the mother load every single day. And if you build your relationship on both of you being receivers from a connection to Jesus that's solid, the relationship can only grow in the lifeblood 
of Jesus, amen? And when you become dependent on each other and not on him, the trust level in both of you is gonna actually go down because the trust will be good until somebody blows it. And since we're human beings, we will. And that's why we gotta learn how to put our relationships in that position of connecting to the lifeblood of Jesus and then using that lifeblood of Jesus to grow with each other. It's a very different way to live. When we talk about romance, when you watch movies about romance, if you watch the, if you watch like, I mean, I'm a personal fan of these because they always end well, but you watch like the Hallmark movies, right? Them babies know nothing about what I'm talking about. That is a foreign concept in romance. Romance is not intimacy. Romance is about romance is about the art of seduction. Now, the art of seduction is fine in a marital relationship as long as it's not the base of the relationship. The relationship has to be based on what you're receiving from Jesus. But what we see in the movies is what? We don't see what I'm talking about in the movies. We see romance. We see seduction. And in the end, what seduction is driven by is power. I'm trying to get you to do something that I want you to do, right? The way I want you to do it, I'm trying to get you to like me in a certain way. And the way I'm trying to do it is I'm trying to impress you with what? The opposite of powerlessness, I'm trying to impress you with power. Most of us are completely terrified of the idea of powerlessness, That's why this piece of the Bible is gonna cause us a big league problem tonight because we're terrified about the idea of paralysis. All you gotta do is put yourself in the hospital. Here's what happens in a hospital setting. You go see somebody. If you wanna go see somebody in the hospital, always go see them on the first day they're there because on the first day they're there, they're going, These nurses are wonderful. This place is wonderful. The food is great. They're taking great care of me. And as long as you're sick as a dog, man, you are the ex, you are the outstanding patient of the day. But then, damn the bad luck, but those people help you to get better. And on the third day, it's like you've been raised from the dead, right? And now you're very mouthy. This place is a hellhole. This food is awful. I can't wait to get out of here. These people stick me at four o'clock in the morning. They're demons. These people are the worst people in America. Time to go home, sucker. That's what I'd say if I were in a hospital. You're better now, go home. You're complaining, go home. That's the barometer. Because you know why? For that one piece of time, you couldn't do and I couldn't do as a patient anything about our powerlessness. But man, the second we can, we are taking it back as fast as is humanly possible. Amen? As fast as is humanly possible. Because what are we ultimately attached to? Well, we're attached to power. We like it. We trust it. We honor it. We massage it. We pay for it. Amen? We love it. It's the whole problem. The fundamental problem with us is that. It's like go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And there's God and God's going, here's how it's gonna happen. I got everything you need in this garden. I can take incredibly good care of you. I can love you well, right? I can provide for your needs. Everything you need is right here. All you're gonna do is hang out with me. We're gonna have fellowship together. We're gonna love each other. We're gonna grow together. You're gonna learn a lot. We're gonna have a lot of fun in this garden and that's the way we're gonna do it. 27 seconds later, the question with Eve was, and Adam, where's the power? If God's gonna give us all that, just, I mean, outright, outright give it to us, which is what grace is. If God's just gonna give it to us, where's our power over God? If God can just give it to us and we don't have to do anything about it, how are we ever gonna get even with God? I mean, he would just be like, he would be like always the one in power. It's like, right, because when you finally realize how much God loves you, you will do anything and everything to allow him to have complete power over your life. That sounds insane, doesn't it? 
Anybody else here believe that tonight, that if you will finally give God 100% of the power in your life, it would be an incredible experience. Like when I can do that for a few days, I'm blown away. Just a few days. Jesus says it like this. Remain in me and I will remain in you. I'm not, Jesus is telling you tonight, despite what's happening to you, I'm not going anywhere. You might go somewhere, but I'm not going anywhere. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch, now get this, a branch, that is you, that is me. The number one problem with pastors and why they quit this job after five years is they, and that's the average, is they decide that they can no longer be a branch. I mean, they went to seminary. They're a hot shot. They have a church now. You know, like I love, I love when people go to me, well, um, you know, who, you know, uh, like what, what church do you, do you go to? I go to like, I go to Cokesbury Church. Oh, really? Who pastors that church? Now, like the typical response, the response I would have given when I had been a pastor for about three years would have been, well, I mean, thank you for asking. I mean, I mean, I do. I do. And I'm pretty proud of it. I mean, like, I pastor that church. Now, 30-some years later, do you know what the answer to the question is? Who pastors that church, that Cokesbury church? I go, well, here's the actual answer to the question. You ready? It's Jesus. <laughs> I just show up there. It's Jesus. I have been smacked around enough times to finally realize that. It's like, don't just say Jesus, though, Mark, like you're the kid at the preschool deal where they come up for the children's message and they always answer Jesus. Actually say Jesus because you know it's right, buddy. I mean, finally, I figured it out. Jesus is pastoring this church. I just show up here and do the work he tells me to do. It works out pretty good that way, amen? amen. I am the vine, you're the branches, you are the branches, for a branch cannot produce fruit, cannot, will not produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So here we are tonight. A bunch of us are very angry branches. We may have to be tonight depending on God, but we wish it wasn't so. We wish that God would say, now little duckling, I'm gonna fix you up. I'm gonna get your compulsion squared away. And you know what? I'm gonna send you off to like flitter around in the little lake or whatever little ducklings do. And then you call me if you need me. But you can be a completely independent duckling. See, that's how we would like it. We would like it if Jesus was our doctor. And Jesus is saying, I'm not gonna be your doctor. I'm gonna be the vine. And when you don't stay connected to me, you die. Like it may be a slow death. It may be a quick death. But 100% of the time, when you decide you're gonna connect to yourself or any other source that you believe is life-giving other than Jesus, you die. Notice, this isn't a menu of options here in this scripture. Are you catching that? Jesus is saying, there, I am the vine, and you are the branch, and there aren't other options on the menu tonight. There's not meatloaf, spaghetti, blah, blah, blah. There's not five ways to do this. There's one way to do it. And all of us, this is the great leveler. You're like, God, I'm glad I'm not an alcoholic in this room tonight. I'm glad he's not talking to me. Sucks for you because I really am talking to you. I, I really could care less if you're codependent, if you're having marital problems, if you have a gambling addiction, a sex addiction. I don't really care what brought you here. I will guarantee you that you will continue to die until you decide that you're gonna be the branch and Jesus is gonna be the vine. Until you realize the life source that you are or are not using because the only authentic one in the room tonight would be Jesus, amen? There isn't another one. And if you're running around looking for your own show, you're gonna keep running and keep being miserable until you come to terms with what he's saying right here. You cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. What is step one? We don't... We hear it in this room. We all just said it together. But the thing I think about step one is, the truth of the matter is, 
80% of us don't actually believe it. We believe that step one is the right thing to say. I mean, if you're going to go to AA, or you're going to go to Al-Anon, or you're going to go to NA, being a good codependent, you want to say the right thing to make everybody else in the room happy, right? Well, the rest of these poor suckers that aren't you, they think they're powerless, dumb idiots. But you're not. But to make them feel better, you'll spout it out. Yeah, I'm powerless. That goes back all the way back to getting a Sunday school sticker when you went to Sunday school 47 weeks in a row or whatever you did. <laughs> I want you to hear that step. We admitted that we were powerless over our compulsion, that our lives had become unmanageable because I think I'm the vine. That is what I think tonight. I think I am the vine. I think I am in charge of the show. It's the state of, it's what I want to call the state of severed. The state of severed is when you think you're connected to something, but the fact of the matter is you're connected to air. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, and this would be the image of that. So like you're on a ski boat and this ski boat is going about 50 miles an hour and you're holding the, you're holding the rope, right? And you're skiing on a, you know, on a wakeboard or whatever. And all of a sudden there you are and you're like having a grand time and you're feeling good and everything's good. But you know what? The rope breaks at the end of the boat. And there you are, holding, you're holding the rope, you're looking good, but the rope is like on a dead even shot in the middle of the air for about seven seconds, and then you know what? You are jacked up, buddy, <laughs> because nothing's pulling you, and the fact of the matter is, gravity is going to take its course, amen, and you're going down, and it probably won't be pretty. Why is that? Because you can't be the boat and the rope, and the skier, and the ski at the same time, despite how hard you want to try that trick out. You can't. And the state of severed is the realization that I have cut myself off from the lifeblood that is being offered to me in Jesus. Jesus isn't telling us I'm the vine and you're the branch to be, you know, for him to be on a power trip. He doesn't need one. He's Jesus. He isn't telling you that in order to be the boss. He's telling you that for one reason. He loves you. He loves you. And he knows that if we don't live with him and in him and in the lifeblood of that vine of his, we will just continue to die, maybe slowly, maybe quickly. Is being severed self-induced sometimes? Sometimes being severed is, you know, is, is been induced, induced by the church, telling you anything but the gospel, telling you you're not a good person, telling you you need to get your act together for Jesus to love you, telling you stuff that just is not true. When someone's trying to tell you something about Jesus, you know what, you want to know how it's true? Here's the litmus test. Ask yourself, would this Jesus who shed blood for me on a cross and died for me on a cross and was on that cross for several hours naked in front of the world on a cross for me with my name on it, would this same Jesus do anything to separate himself from me. No. And if someone's telling you something else, it's just, it's not the gospel. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Here's the part. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, what does that mean? That means... Nothing. Nothing means nothing. You can't get sober. You won't be okay. This won't work out. This won't have a good ending. This won't be something you can go, yeah, well, I was able to do that by myself, which takes me to the next step. Came to believe that a power greater than me, Jesus the vine, could restore me to sanity, Amen. 
came to believe that a power greater than me could restore me to sanity. How much do we know, do you think, about the state of nothing? What I mean by that is, what can you do? He's answering this question for me, right? Jesus is going, what can you do to restore yourself? What can you do to become a better person? What can you do to become sober? What can you do? I mean, listen, there are, aren't there like, shouldn't there be like, I mean, books you can read? Shouldn't there be like knowledge you can get and take care of and like learn this? Can't, I mean, why, why can't you just get a hold of this compulsion of yours? I mean, other people don't have it. Why do you? What is your deal? Every bit of what I'm saying to you is coming straight out of mouth, the mouth of the enemy. It's not coming out of the mouth of God. Because God knows the kind of life that we have without him. And he's saying to us, please attach yourself to the vine. Please attach yourself to the vine. There is an illusion that we have tonight of control. The state of nothing is, is that I don't really want to believe that there's nothing I can do to make myself better. I don't want to believe that it's got to be a power greater than me. I don't even know anything about a power greater than me. I know. I know. Neither did I. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me will produce much fruit. Get it. Hear what Jesus is saying. I am. I am your vine because I need to be your vine, right? You are the branch because you need to be the branch because this is the way that life flows the best and the fullest and the freest. I am the vine and you are the branches and it needs to be just like that. And the question is, what is keeping you from that? And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna open up during the last song the space in front of me for some prayer. I want you to ask yourself some questions. What are you connected to? What are you connected to right now tonight? Is it life-giving? Is it Jesus? Is it some other vine? Do you think it's you? And here's the next question. Can what you are connected to give you fruit? Because if it can't, you know where you need to be in a couple of minutes? You need to be up here in front with us, either on your knees, asking Jesus to connect you, which he will, or B, taking a surrender chip from one of us, realizing that you have zero business being your own vine. That is a huge recovery step that you can take tonight. I know you think you're good at it, and I know you think somehow if you keep doing it, you'll figure it out, but you won't. But Jesus is right here tonight, more than willing to connect you to himself. It just takes a surrender chip saying, you know what, I am sick and tired of doing this the way I've been doing it and I'm realizing that I'm being sucked dry and the thing that I've tried to connect myself to cannot give me fruit, cannot give me life and cannot give me freedom. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.